Once upon a time in the early 2000s, there was the original Bionicle storyline, a LEGO action figure series about robotic characters who wore specific headgear and controlled the elements. After running for about 9 years, the series reached its conclusion in 2010, and to this day, it stands as one of the most ambitious multimedia narratives ever designed for children, with content spanning across comics, movies, video games, web serials, as well as chapter books. For a while, it seemed like the franchise's time in the spotlight was over. But then, one day, Bionicle was reborn. Following the LEGO Hero Factory toy line that lasted from 2010 until the end of 2014, the year 2015 ushered in the Bionicle reboot, with a new setting, new ideas, and completely new Technic pieces, but with a return to the island aesthetics, as well as the original six characters that started it all. Tahu, Kopaka, Liwa, Pohatu, Gali, and Onua. This is Lava Pasta's Guide to Bionicle Part 5, Rebirth. On a distant island overrun by skull-shaped spiders, the prayers of six villager tribes are answered by the arrival of six mythical heroes, who are destined to find golden masks of power and bring peace to the island of Okoto. This new island isn't quite as fleshed out as the island of Mata Nui from 2001, but it is still a return to form, and although the new villager tribes all wear what is effectively the same mask piece, I do appreciate how they aren't bound by the same gender restrictions as the Matoran from Generation 1. Any female character you imagine can now be part of any elemental tribe you want, and still fit in with the story's canon, which is much more freeing to the imagination. I know that Hero Factory was kind of lackluster, but their greatest contribution to society was the CCBS system, a series of Technic parts specifically focused on ball joints, which gave us Glatorian hands that were much less prone to fracturing, made the figures feel like they had more volume, and gave them more geometric shapes in their designs. It may not have as many steampunk pistons as the previous generation of Bionicle, but the CCBS system used for the Bionicle reboot offers a lot of improvements. By making the figures look like they consist of basic shapes, they become much easier for artists to draw, so it makes perfect sense that Bionicle 2015 also consists of Flash cartoons made with 2D animation. The biggest reason why I even started making videos about Bionicle in the first place is because of the 2015 reboot's approach to character design. Because in my eyes, the 2015 January wave has some of the greatest character designs in Bionicle history. Each member of the original cast has their own distinct silhouette, which makes them stand out from each other. Characters have height differences, Kopaka has massive shoulder pads, Pohatu's armor is asymmetrical, Onua has a gigantically wide torso, Gali has feminine body proportions, Tahu's blades spike out from his back like samurai battle flags, and while Liwa's mask might not look anything like his past incarnations, his weapons do look like a combination of his axe from 2001 with his arrow blades from 2002. What's more, they actually made a gearbox function that doesn't get in the way of articulation, and to top it all off is the fantastic return of dual weapon functionality, which had not been present since 2002 and 2004. Personally, I never was able to acquire the 8572 Tahu Nuva figure that came with a lava surfboard, 
but I was able to get Toa Lecon's Sky Surfboard in 2004. And with 2015, I finally achieved my childhood dream of owning a Tahu figure riding on his iconic lava surfboard. I'll admit that the exposed ball joints under the torso can be a little distracting, but this can be easily remedied as long as you have a few of these socket pieces in your collection. And even so, 70787 Tahu Master of Fire is the definitive Tahu action figure. It condenses everything you love about his original character designs into the same package, and updates it for the modern era, featuring a mask that combines the wideness of his Toa Nuva mask with the elegance of the original Kanohi Hao. The mask pieces are attached via a brand new connection point on the sides of the Bionicle faces, much like how an actual mask would. And there's even an extra pearl gold mask packaged alongside all of the main characters, which feels incredibly reminiscent of the Golden Kanohi masks from 2001. Extremely rare pieces that could only be found by opening blind boxes and getting lucky. Each of the 2015 January sets also includes an extra mask design in the form of a skull spider, which might seem flimsy or ineffective at first glance, but I think they're genius. Given that they're obvious callbacks to the Visorak from 2005 and the mind-controlling Krana from 2002, using the spiders as mask pieces allows you to transform any Bionicle character into a temporary antagonist. It gives you a contextual reason to have members of the main cast fight each other, just like how kids in 2001 would do so when they only had access to the original Toa characters. The Bionicle 2015 Summer Wave gave us access to more antagonists in the form of the Skull Army which on one hand is the natural evolution of the Skull Spiders, but I was honestly never too jazzed about these figures, and it's not just because the Skeleton War meme stopped being funny even before 2015, it's because I don't really think that Skeletons are a good fit for the franchise. Since a Bionicle figure without its armor is already a Skeleton, Making one into a Bionicle set feels like a contextual excuse to not include as many armor pieces, which results in a flimsier figure with less volume. In other words, the opposite of what the CCBS system is supposed to offer. Furthermore, skeleton armies have already been antagonists in previous LEGO themes, so while they might technically be new villains in the context of Bionicle, they feel more like generic villains in the context of LEGO as a whole. Of course, the main villain of the new Bionicle storyline still goes by the name Makuta, but unlike Makuta Teradax of Generation 1, who was introduced as the jealous brother of the deity figure Mata Nui, this version of Makuta is introduced as the jealous brother of the legendary mask maker Ikimu, where the two were once peers of the same craft until Makuta's envy causes him to create a dangerous mask of ultimate power, which results in him getting sent to the Shadow Realm and Ikimu's death when he tries to intervene. After the main characters arrive on the island of Okoto and recover their masks of power, they set off to find the tomb of Akimu the Mask Maker. And like a microcosm of the franchise itself, they actually manage to resurrect him from death. Only to find that Akimu's mask of creation has been stolen by 2015's final boss, the Skull Grinder. Unfortunately, in the Flash cartoons, it's not the main cast working together as a team that defeats him, rather they all get knocked out, and Akimu winds up defeating the villain instead, which to me feels anticlimactic. I think it would have been much better if after they lose their golden masks, 
they switch back to their original masks and then manage to win the battle even with the odds stacked against them, which could still end the year's story the same way that it already does. In 2016, Akimu rebuilds the main cast into completely new appearances, just like how every Toa team in Generation 1 went through some sort of transformation resulting in more action figures to sell. And if you were to ask me what I think of these character designs, my answer is that they're kind of a mess. I like the Nuva symbols, but I also think the crystalline features look ugly, the overabundance of sword pieces in nearly every set doesn't make them as unique as the previous year's weapons, and the 2016 masks, despite being dual molded, look really bad in my opinion. While Tahu Master of Fire feels like the definitive Tahu action figure, Tahu Uniter of Fire feels like he's just another iteration of the character. Or at least, in his base form, because the main feature of the set is his ability to combine with a Firebird character from a different set, which does make him look a lot better. You'd think that I'd be all over the combination mechanic given my love of giant robots, but the problems here is that you have to spend more money to get the animal power-ups, and the base forms for the hero characters aren't very good to begin with. I'd much rather have a figure that looks great on its own and can be combined with an expansion pack to make it look even better, instead of a bad figure that needs to be combined with another figure in order to look good at all. It just feels like a waste of money when there's a much better character design from 2015 that I already have. If I had to purchase at least one of the Bionicle 2016 figures, my choice would either be the Toa Scale Akimu set, or the villain character Umarak the Hunter, because he's a substantial antagonist in the narrative, and because the set includes Makuta's old Golden Mask of Control, which foreshadows the fact that Umarak is working for Makuta, despite him being trapped in the Shadow Realm. In the 2016 Journey to One story animations, Umarak basically sets a bunch of traps for the animals, harasses the protagonists a few times, and once he gets his hands on the Mask of Control, he uses it to summon a bunch of elemental beasts, as well as to transform himself into an abomination. Which I think is an accurate description, because the elemental beast figures are probably some of the worst looking Bionicle sets that I've ever seen. Compared to their concept art, they look like a giant vomit of Technic parts, and just as with the Skull Army, they feel super generic. But what's worse is that they don't even feel relevant to the year's theme of animal powers. Like, imagine how much cooler it would be if Umarak transformed into a giant centaur because of his antlers, and the elemental beasts were instead hybrid creatures like mermaids, minotaurs, or harpies, but with their own made-up group name like the Borak or the Rakshi from Generation 1. Honestly, I would have even been fine if they tried making CCBS versions of those classic Bionicle antagonists, just as long as their backstories were different so that the reboot still feels like its own thing. Sadly, in 2016, the Bionicle franchise was once again cancelled. But as someone who was never interested enough to buy any of the 2016 sets, I can kind of understand why. After the first wave of 2015 action figures, I feel like the character designs started getting less and less refined, to the point where the 2016 figures aren't quite as interesting as when the reboot first started. But that's not to say that I hate Bionicle Generation 2. Again, I really appreciate how it helped me finally achieve one of my childhood dreams, and I was super on board when it first started, it's just that they didn't keep up the momentum, and didn't really flesh out the narrative's lore as much as they could, 
opting for general, nondescript ideas rather than specific species names. As a whole, Bionicle Generation 2 is still cool, but it also feels kind of... generic. Which isn't terrible, it just is what it is. Now, since I have so many opinions on this subject, you might be asking me, well, what exactly does Lava want from a Bionicle reboot? And if so, I'm glad you asked, because I have a few ideas. Hypothetically, if the Bionicle franchise was rebooted once more, my ideal stage for that would be the Lego Bionicle movie which I imagine would use the same animation style that Studio Animal Logic made for the Lego movie and be directed by Taika Waititi. I want to see this in the style of This, This, and This, a Bionicle movie that focuses on the original Toa characters as the main protagonist, where the humor is tongue-in-cheek, and most importantly, where the people working on it are actually from cultures that have lived on Pacific Islands. Ever since the controversy with the Maori people in 2002, where after they realized that a European toy company was basically stealing Maori words for their profitable action figure series, a settlement was made where some Polynesian titles were kept, but several of them were changed to entirely different words. And while I'm glad that the Maori people stood up for themselves, because they had every right to be angry, I also feel like LEGO backpedaled too far by not focusing on the island environments as much, when instead, they could have just hired Polynesian consultants to help them make more informed decisions. Metru Nui could have also been an island too. Much like how the 2016 Disney film Moana involved the creative input of Hawaiian and Polynesian individuals, I think that LEGO should hire Maori and Polynesian artists to create a future Bionicle story. I want the franchise to keep going back to its island roots, but I don't want any cultures to be disrespected. Rather, I want artists who are from those backgrounds to have their voices included in the work and be properly compensated for their efforts. I mean, if you're trying to make a fictional island environment feel organic, wouldn't the most qualified experts for that job be people from cultures that have actually lived on islands? And of course, white artists would still be allowed in the writer's room. It's not like any one race would have a monopoly over the story, I'm just saying that Greg Farshti, Christian Faber, or the original team don't need to be the sole authors of Bionicle anymore. That we should welcome different creators onto that team, and entrust the future to a new generation. Even if my ideal vision will never become real, even if 2016 truly was the final year of the franchise, its narrative will still continue to live on in our memories. As long as we have the imagination, Bionicle can be anything we want it to be. It can be our own fan-created stories. It can be a celebration of Polynesian culture, helmed by Maori creators. Or it can be a combination of both possibilities at once, just as long as there's aesthetic beauty, character writing, and narrative ambition. A story about robots living in organic environments that espouses the virtues of working together, taking responsibility, and finding your purpose. Unity, duty, destiny. No matter what happens, Bionicle will always be a work of art.